and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Another episode of The Nonprofit Show. And today we have Jennifer Oliva, CPA, also managing partner with your part-time controller. So thrilled to have you back with us, Jennifer. And you've spent a lot of time with us over the last couple of years. But this week is a special week because it is your part-time controller, but we always like to say YPTC Power Week. So today you're going to share with us five frightening financial frauds. <laughs> and I'm excited uh, to have you on to, to talk to us about this. So before we dive into the conversation, we want to remind our viewers and our listeners who we are. So hello to Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group, and honored to serve alongside Julia as the co-host we're also extremely honored to have the continued support from so many of our amazing presenting sponsors, including your part-time controller. Also want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Nonprofit Nerd, and another shout out to your part-time controller. So thank you so very much to our sponsors that keep these episodes going and growing. We're nearing 650. So I know we touted 600, but now we're nearing 650 and uh, just honored to have these ongoing conversations. Speaking of these ongoing conversations, if you missed any, you know where to find us, Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, Vimeo, and podcasts. So go ahead and queue us up wherever you stream your entertainment. And again, Jennifer Oliva, so glad to have you back with us. Welcome. Oh, thanks. It's great to be back. You know, Jennifer, you have been one of those go-to people for us. I like to tell the story and I'm going to remind everybody <laughs> that we had you on an early episode of the nonprofit show and there was a congressional action that was being voted on and you had your phone and you were telling us real time yeah. as the votes were coming in because it had such a huge impact to the nonprofit sector um, the stimulus dollars that came in and just all these things that were changing Whew. yeah but things are still changing aren't they they still are changing and today we're going to talk about some of the all of that flow of pandemic relief funding uh, and sometimes it doesn't uh, turn out all that great and some people don't use it to the way it was supposed to be used uh, right. but during the time when the pandemic first started uh, it was it was stressful for everybody uh, nonprofits were really under tremendous stress and it was our pleasure to help them get through that very uh, tumultuous time and um, now we're hopefully coming out on the other side of it but there's more issues as there always are uh, in the industry. yeah I just crossed my fingers for those of you <laughs> listening I'm like hopefully we're on the other side yes. well you had shared a little bit about how the pandemic has opened new ways for fraud talk to us about that Jennifer yeah, so the, you know, it's external to the organization, internal to the organization, and then really just to the general public. I mean, first, external to the organization, pandemic has created um, you know, the virtual work environment that we um, makes us more susceptible to fraud because we're working in this new way and fraudsters are loving the change and taking us up on the vulnerabilities that they see and uh, infiltrating organizations in that way. And then of course, internally, um, a lot of organizations haven't revised their uh, internal controls or their policies and procedures to meet the new virtual work environment. We're doing a lot more electronic bill pay, wires, ACHs, and that is really a cause for concern in many organizations. And then you have the great resignation and the quiet quitting. Um, you have disengagement of employees and that potentially is creates an environment that is ripe for fraud. And then you have this external risk, people that are setting up fraudulent nonprofits to prey on people's emotions that want to help in the pandemic relief and also in world events like the war in Ukraine. So um, they're coming up with new ways to steal. Yeah. And you're going to talk to us about internal and external community bases, yes. all of that. So let's start off with this frightening fraud number one. Yes, yes. The, our, our face, you know, it's the, the home alone. Face. 
Uh, so tell us about number one, the one you've identified. For so free. yeah, so we can talk a little bit of uh, two outside frauds, uh, you know, a, a threat to um, the organizations from the outside of the organization. So first, let's talk about electronic threats. Um, the FBI has reported that $43 billion has been lost on schemes in the US. Now, this isn't just nonprofits, it's all organizations, but $43 billion on things on fraud schemes called social engineering. And there's a couple different types of that. And you're going to love these definitions. There's phishing, there's vishing, and there's smishing. <laughs> so phishing is sending fraudulent emails intended to trick the reader into uh, revealing personal information uh, or uh, tricking the re reader, uh, reader of the email into sending uh, money to a fraudulent uh, to the fraudster, I guess. And then the vishing is making phone calls. So that's not emails, it's phone calls that purport to be from reputable companies. And then smishing is that's fraud done by text message. Oh, <laughs> so, and wow. those are new to me. So I've heard yes. phishing, but mm -hmm. phishing and smishing are new. Yes. So new vocabulary, and we're talking about the theme of the pandemic and the new way of doing business, really increasing fraud um, opportunities uh, for nonprofits. And I have a couple that um, really go to these in this category, the external threats. Um, so yeah. this is, just came out in August. It was, uh, the headline is, local and federal law enforcement are investigating a scam in Lexington, Kentucky which allegedly saw criminals send bogus wire transfer information to city staff. So the fraudsters mm. sent bogus, bogus emails to city staff saying, we're changing, pretending to be a nonprofit that they're funding. Right. So right. there's this right. outside nonprofit that the city's funding wow. and the fraudster sends these emails saying, "I, you know, we changed our wire transfer information right pretending to be that nonprofit the city sends the money to the fraudster and not to the proper nonprofit to the tune of 4 million dollars wow oh, that is just heartbreaking it's a, and a classic fishing scheme classic absolutely wow that's uh, a big another, impact big impact another one uh this is in September, just this month, September 1st, uh, credential phishing attack targeted 16,000 emails at a nonprofit agency. I'm just going to read some of the, uh, the headlines here on this or the, the summary here. Researchers have uncovered an effective recent phishing attack where the fraudster claims to be the uh, prominent charge card brand American Express and demands that cardholders open an attachment, open an attachment, big risk, and contact the card company immediately regarding the cardholder's account. And of course, they're looking for the cardholder's information, uh, their login information so that they can get into their account. And this happens all the time. Uh, these fraudsters actually attacked a, a nonprofit agency, a larger one, and 16,000 employees got this email and got this um, request to send their personal American Express information uh, to the fraudster. Now, um, you know, many nonprofits have company credit cards and they might have been, you know, if I was an employee and not trained employee of a nonprofit, I'd be potentially nervous. Like, oh, they're trying to get into my company American Express account. Let me take care of this. Right. So there's a lot of ways that nonprofits can be safe, uh, safer and help avoid these both of these phishing situations. First of all, have a rule, never click on or open an attachment unless you confirm it's safe. You know, Jennifer, I was aware of um, several organizations in my community that got an email and talking about purchasing gift cards. And oh, staff said to the CEO, classic. hey, hey, I got those gift cards you asked me to get. And they were like, what? I, to the tune of like thousands of dollars. And so this can really ruin a lot of these nonprofits because, you know, if we're operating at a very slim margin anyway, it's very destructive. 
It's extremely disruptive and it's so important for nonprofits to have the right controls in place and also the rules of the road and making sure that they're checking that people are not um, going against the, the policies that they set up. So we always tell our, our clients and, and other nonprofits, they have to have ways internally to confirm and multiple ways to confirm mm -hmm. if they've gotten an email, you never um, go ahead and make a transaction based on just the email. You're going to have to call the recipient, call multiple sources to confirm that, especially if you're going to wire or um, ACH money or even uh, send money electronically through a bill pay system. So you also have to have multiple people involved, checks and balances. Mm -hmm. If one person is in charge of sending all the uh, electronic payments, um, there's that's easily set up for risk that from an outside source getting to that one person and changing having them change things and we always preach about employee awareness training you know you set up those kind of fake uh scams internally and see if people bite and then you're like okay you've been on this now you really need the training so right. instead of having a real scam you have a fake scam <laughs> <laughs> like a secret shopper, right? <laughs> a secret shopper coming in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, you know, you've given us so many ideas of, of new ways to look at this. Let's dig down now to fraud number two, because yes. fraud number one was a hair on fire moment for me. Okay. Yeah. Fraud so, number two. So fraud number two was, so we're at fraud number three. So just okay. to review we had okay. two phishing schemes okay, one gotcha. was a credential phishing scheme and one was just the classic vendor sending the information to the nonprofit for um to to send the wire to the wrong place the city officials so now i'm going to talk about inside jobs um these are called occupational frauds this is employee theft or financial statement fraud but i'm going to focus on the employee theft okay. and we always talk about the, the the fraud triangle in our circles. The triangle in our circles. I thought that was funny, but anyway, <laughs> I like it. The no, fraud like triangle. It. <laughs> the fraud triangle are you know, there's three things the components that can set you up and get you know make it ripe for fraud in your organization. Um, one is the opportunity uh, that the organization has that there's less um, not there's not internal controls that are in place. Mm -hmm. uh, one is pressure on an employee. They might have a, a, extreme financial issues that they are um, facing. Uh, and then there's rationalization. And that's a big thing during the pandemic. And we're talking about uh, employee disengagement. And they're like, oh, well, the, this nonprofit doesn't care about me anyway. Uh, it's I'm just going to, I'm rationalizing that I can steal because um, there's, perhaps other people doing it too. There's not a proper tone at the top. So when we talk about these inside jobs, um, there's a couple ways people do this. And you know, one is, um, especially in the pandemic, there was so much money going around that federal government was you know, dishing it out very quickly before we had uh, proper internal controls in some cases to make sure everything was handled properly. And then, so there was this one um, Minnesota based nonprofit organization um, that helps to feed underprivileged children. And this, the federal government was giving them uh, $240 million or even actually more because 240 million was the actual fraud that was perpetrated. Mm -hmm. uh, the employees, were not using, they were um, laundering the money through the organization, allegedly uh, through the organization uh, to, uh, and, and using the money for their own purposes. And it was rampant throughout the organization and never got to the recipients that was intended for. Um, a whistleblower was uh, one that uh, blew, that brought this to the attention of the FBI. It was actually the Minnesota Department uh, of Education said this nonprofit is sending all of this money uh, out to organizations that I we do not think is actually helping the um, intended recipients were these children that were needed uh, meals. So um, this makes me wonder about this nonprofit. It was, it was rampant, it sounded like, because multiple employees were involved. Um, where was the board? 
That's what I was going to ask. Like, yeah. Have you seen that boards have become more complacent during this time? Because they're the fiduciary agents. Can you share with us about that, Jennifer? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's really worse than it was. Uh, I don't have any evidence to support that. But I will say that boards have been distracted in many cases with other problems and maybe sure. been leaving like the policies and procedures the internal controls, the proper review of financial statements. Um, they haven't been on top of that as much of their um, than they were potentially when there wasn't so much stress and other issues going on, like during the pandemic. Like, are we going to survive? Right, and they're not meeting in you know IRL in real life. So think about all those board meetings where you know those reports are distributed. And yeah. everybody sits and looks at them versus, oh, did you look at them through the board portal? And people are like, oh, yeah, I skimmed it. Yeah, I can exactly. see what you're saying, that, that it's just kind of yeah. a light fall through yeah. that is happening. So wow. the boards, I think, need to remind, you know, be reminded. And, and of course, proper board training is so important about their fiduciary responsibilities, as well as setting the proper tone at the top yeah. uh, and making sure that they're behavior, their ethics in um, in speech <laughs> and in action uh, are what they want the uh, organization, all the staff members of that organization to follow. And they want to have an executive that is going to be you know, really uh, walking the talk when it comes to ethical behavior and setting that tone at the top. Right. You know, Angela Cuxham, your uh, wonderful manager uh, was on yeah. again, nonprofit power week yesterday started with your part time controller. And she reminded us the importance of tone at the top. And I don't think we hear that enough. Or when we hear it, we kind of gloss over it because it sounds good. But I was struck once again, at how um, really important that concept is. And I can see it even now today as we chat that yeah. it really does, you know, filter down and impact what's going on. Yeah. Okay, so I got to say, whoa. we're going on to four then, right? We're going on to four. We're going Woo! on to number four. Again. Um, and this is the classic, we're still in the inside jobs. This is the classic rogue bookkeeper fraud, <laughs> which we see sadly all the time. So uh, the headline is this recently a bookkeeper of a Hawaii based nonprofit was jailed for six months for writing checks to herself to pay for her own family parties and trips. She also liked to set up fake fundraisers to use the money for her own use. So she was uh, double duty in the frauds that she was trying, she was um, uh, pulling off. And um, so it's interesting during the pandemic, so many people switched to electronic bill pay system. And they're, again, I was mentioning that the internal controls in that realm aren't fully set up in, in many cases, but still there's a lot of people still using good old paper checks and the, you, the risks of individuals having no supervision and being able to sign checks, do the bank reconciliations, prepare the financials, all of the duties are all with one person uh, is a situation that is ripe for fraud. It didn't, it hasn't changed through the pand pandemic, but it's sad for these people because it was, this is a small nonprofit um, and it was a $70,000 fraud, not humongous, but um, it really hurt, can hurt the reputation of the organization. And it did in this case where funders are like, hey, um, you're not really showing your fiduciary responsibility and uh, perhaps we're going to pull our funding from you. And that's that's a risk that nonprofits have when there is a um, documented fraud case with them. So you're right. And then, you know, to talk about it with you know, if you're a C6 and your members that are part of the association, I mean, yeah. that can really just breed some bad blood within the trust, the rapport of the community. Um, and to think, you know, if this person did that this time, how many other times has that also been done, perhaps in previous years? My question, Jennifer, do you then recommend a forensic audit or, or some kind of deep dive to see just how far back this might have gone? Yes, we always, I always say when there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, okay. So sure, if we see fraud in one area, like 
um, checks being written to oneself. <laughs> Perhaps there was a fraud in the payroll area. Perhaps there was a cover up in um, checks coming into the organization that were misappropriated or cash coming into the organization that was misappropriated. So we try to um, encourage our nonprofits to do a deep dive into all of their um, potential areas for fraud risk and whether it's us that help them with that. We're not forensic accountants, but we can certainly help with some of those details uh, or pull out another non um, uh, organization that can help uh, take that deep dive with them. And we also encourage our uh, nonprofits to, uh, to law enforcement, uh, it, because if this person is doing this to you, like you said, Jared, maybe they are, uh, they have already uh, defrauded another nonprofit. And we hear that in the news all the time. We've seen it in practice. Uh, and if we don't speak up, they're going to potentially hurt a nonprofit and we want to you know, protect our uh, fellow nonprofits for sure. I, I always encourage people to speak up. It's hard because I talked about that reputational risk and that could hurt a nonprofit when they do speak up with their funding sources. But I just think, you know, as they say, honesty is the best policy and transparency uh, to your funders, I think is the best way to go. Absolutely. Well, talk to us about the external factors of this and how it could hurt the public. As we mentioned, yes. you know, if this is internal um, and, and you just read that headline, you yeah. know, how good, how does this impact then the greater community? Absolutely. So there's this other good old uh, fashioned nonprofit uh, fraud called uh, setting up a scammy nonprofit to rip off the general public. That's my title. <laughs> wow. Um, and, and this is number five. Are we on? This is number five. We are number five frightening frauds. We are okay. in number, on number five. Uh, and uh, in July, the New York Times reported, uh, this is the headline, 76 fake charities shared a mailbox and the IRS approved them all. And you're just going to love this story. Uh, I think many people actually have heard this story because it was widely reported, but it's always good to, to review. And remember the interesting facts or, or alleged facts around uh, the uh, uh, or the details of the story, alleged details. So a, a convicted stock market fraudster, once accused of dangling a man out of a building, got the IRS to approve 76 nonprofits often despite glaring red flags of potential fraud. Um, his operations stole the names of better known charities. They claimed to be located where they obviously were not. He stole about $152,000 from those nonprofits that it flowed through online giving platforms uh, that people were just scammed. They didn't look really further into the, um, the nonprofit. Uh, they maybe saw the name. It looked like American Cancer Society or United Way, and they just gave money to the charity. And luckily, the authorities are on top of this one. Uh, but you know, what are we learning from this otherwise? I mean, I would say you know, it's well documented that the IRS is um, way behind on their enforcement and is letting things slip. Um, but Perhaps the new funding, and this is controversial. I know that the you know the the IRS funding, um, but the, to us, and we know this, the uh, as accountants, um, the agency is definitely underfunded. There's definitely ways they could use the money in different ways, and perhaps it will help nonprofits. Um, uh, the more legitimate nonprofits show themselves, you know, pro more properly to the public um, instead of the headlines showing these, you know, fake scams taking over. And uh, so we, we're hoping that, you know, in the future, the IRS will be able to focus more on uh, weeding out the um, improper nonprofits quicker. Right. Uh, and then, you know, for the general public, if you're giving money to an organization, no who you're giving to. There's organizations out there like GuideStar, Charity Navigator, uh, Better, Better Business Bureau, and the or own organization's websites. Um, look for the IRS filings and proper financial statements on the websites before you give. And uh, 
Yeah. Well, I can't I tell you. I probably go to GuideStar, known as Candid now, you can. at least mm-hmm. weekly, if not daily. <laughs> but yeah. it is one of those bookmark for me, you know, do your research, look for that transparency, the seal of transparency. You know, Julia, we talk about this often, but our community, we're so known as being benevolent, but these five financial, you know, frauds, frightening financial frauds, let's talk about alliteration and a mouthful, Jennifer. <laughs> it is scary. And so I'm sure that there's, you know, viewers and listeners paying attention to today's episode going, what do I do? But I love that you wove in, Jennifer. So thank you. So many things, you know, in regards to those policies and the internal controls, that's yeah. where we need to focus our time. And I think building the public's trust, a a nonprofit has that job and to be transparent, to show their financials on their website to and their uh, IRS filings and to let um, the public know that they they can trust a particular organization because they're doing everything right. They have um, proper board policies. They have a whistleblower policy, a conflict of interest policy. There's so many things a nonprofit can do to um, to gain the trust of the public and to um, I guess it and it helps all nonprofits when every nonprofit does their job to make themselves transparent. It does. I think what you're saying is magical. And that is for the good parts and the bad parts, it impacts us all. And so that's why we we need to be sharing these messages and these stories, because um, just because you think that, you know, you've been immune from this, your organization has been, um, you are impacted whether you know it or not. Yeah, that New York Times article was chilling because um, it was so simple and, and that fraudster changed the name just a little bit to Correct. sound like all these other, you know, venerable organizations. And so yeah. it's yeah. really a, a frightening thing. I always love it when you come on and, right. and talk to us and, and share your knowledge so, with us. But I want to oh, let yes. everybody <laughs> know that mission business is a really cool thing that you all have on the YPTC.com website. It is a podcast where your experts come in and talk about things. It's really well done. And um, I think this is a great way to get new information and it's free. You don't have to be a client of YPTC. I mean, it's an amazing thing that you're offering up, Jennifer. I so appreciate you mentioning it because there's actually specific to the topic we're discussing today. There's several podcasts and our most recent podcasts really address some of the issues we talked about today. I talked to two members of NASCO, which is the National Association of State Charity Officials. And we talk about state regulations for nonprofits, as well as some of the investigation of cases that they have um, about fraudsters setting up unlawful nonprofits to benefit themselves and what nonprofits can do to um, support themselves and and look the best to the public. And I have an older podcast um, still on our website at YPTC.com with Jerry Williams, a former FBI agent. And we talked about some uh, interesting fraud cases. Fraud is something people find a lot of interest in. It's kind of like the uh, true crime stories and it is interesting, but there's a lot to be learned for nonprofits uh, about hearing these stories. And one more plug, uh, we have our um, YPTC October National Webinar, and that's on October 19th. Okay. Uh, look out for this, look out for this on our website. And that is, topic is anti-fraud best practices. So also another timely um, uh, webinar it. and event that we're holding for and you, you said that's October 20th, so uh, 19th. 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 October 19th, just shy of a month away. So make sure you get that on your calendar, yptc.com. Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, the rest of the Power Week with your team, your part-time controller team. So again, to Today, we've had Jennifer Oliva, CPA, Managing Partner with your part-time controller with us. Thanks again. It's been fantastic. Julie and I always love chatting with you. I love chatting with you, and we're so appreciative to partner with the nonprofit show. We love being part of it, and uh, we're really happy to sponsor Power Week and get to show off all of our great, some of our 
great members of staff. You know, uh, they are great. And, uh, you know, they all bring something different to our conversations every day. But what I find really intriguing is that they weave through a lot of common things. Um, and so it's just a, a pleasure to have your team on and to, to talk about everything. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom. Again, we wanna thank all of our presenting sponsors. Nonprofit Power Week doesn't come along very often. Jarrett and I only have these a couple times a year, and so it's really a, a, a marvelous uh, thing. And, and to this week, it's YPTC, yourparttimecontroller.com. Again, our sponsors, American Nonprofit Academy, Bloomerang, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Nonprofit Nerd. These are the folks that help bring our content every day. You said, Jarrett, we're marching towards episode 650? We really are. Yes. Wow. No wonder I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> we're all exhausted. Congratulations to both of you. That's, well, that's and thank you for, for the partnership. Yeah, it's been amazing. We yeah. love doing this. Um, even with me traveling this week, I text Julia and I said, I just, I miss it. I miss the show. So I have to be here. So thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks, Jennifer, for joining us. And as we end every episode, we want to remind you to stay well so you continue to do well. And we'll see you back here tomorrow.